I, the fact that the Proteas are the number one ODI side, you know, they're always up there in the, you know, rankings on all yeah. formats. Um, does that compound the matter that they've sort of got this the standard to live up to? Or when you look at a team like Pakistan, who kind of dropped in the rankings over the years, but always seem to do well in um, knockout yeah. games, is it that sort of nothing to lose approach yeah. versus I've got the standard yeah. that I've got to sort of yeah. live up to? Well, I've always said the two most dangerous teams to play against is a team that's full of confidence and a team that's got nothing to lose. Mm. So it's very easy going into these tournaments as the underdog because nobody expects you to win. It's tough going in as the top dog or the person who's expected mm. to win. But if you're filled with genuine confidence, then it's not that tough to hold mm. that position. But if you go in as number one and you perceived to be, the, well, they are obviously the favorites of your number one, and you try and pretend that you're really full of confidence, but mm. actually what sits underneath it is some doubt, then it, you know, I don't think that team is very dangerous at all because it's very, as soon as there's a small crack opens, as soon as there's a little bit of pressure, you really tap into that hidden doubt and it just literally bubbles through. Mm. So let's just focus on the pro tiers um, before we let you go. Um, in terms of the current pro tiers management, um, uh, Russell Domingo's contract obviously uh, coming to an end. Do you think a major shakeup is needed there um, and in terms of the other coaching structures or is it again just down to player belief? I mean that's a very good question that and I think we in the sports world we're too quick to use results as a measure of mm. how good is a coach doing, how good is a team doing, how good is a captain doing. Results is a very small uh, a very insignificant, not insignificant, it's a very um, inaccurate measure of how successful a team is going about their business. And I think in time, 10 years time, when we look back on how we choose coaches, how we choose captains, how we hire them and fire them, and particularly how we support them to succeed, I think in 10 years time, we'll look back at today and go, wow, I can't believe we're doing it like that. It was like really not the smartest way to go ahead. Mm. Um, there are a lot more criteria that make up success. So, you know, it's, it's the kind of connection in a team between players. Um, it's the, the happiness factor uh, amongst players. It's how, how good is the information intelligence that's gone into c creating the strategies, the way we're practicing, the way we're doing debriefs after a game, the way we're planning for a game the kind of strategies that we've got going onto the field, plan A, plan B, and plan C. How smart is the information that's gone into those plans? Um, I would say the best measure of, generally, of a coach or a captain, or one of the best measures, is actually to go and ask the team members, do you think this person is setting you up with the best <coughs> possible chance of success? Are they serving you as best possible? Um, but we're not really asking those questions a whole lot. We just look at results, and if results are fine, we leave a coach. And very often, a really strong team with a strong senior leadership group can keep a team winning for a long space of time, and the coach can be relatively ineffective. You can also have teams that are busy building and, and finding their feet, and you can have a highly effective coach or a highly effective captain, but the team is actually in its building phase, so it's not winning. So results is an incomplete measure. Um, I think we need to look at what are the measures that constitute success for a coach and a captain we need to first define those and understand them and then go and bring that to team to be able to decide is this coach, is this mm. captain doing a great job. And to a fair degree, you know, businesses, they do that. There, there's a lot of other measures to try and figure out is this business manager, is this leader creating an environment mm. that brings the best out of people, that harnesses the best thinking and sets up with the best possible chance of success. Okay. Paddy, you've obviously also been heavily involved in the IPL. Uh, a lot of debate around whether that helps or hinders national teams, what do you feel? Um, playing in the IPL really helps players learn how to play under pressure. Mm. It exposes them to players. They sit in the same change room with players from other, other countries. It is the most fertile learning environment available in the world game for any player who wishes to tap into that potential. Mm. So it really does help. Um, what I think we will see in time at the moment, there is probably a gluttony of cricket. So each of mm -hmm. the countries is competing to have their T20 tournament. The, mm -hmm. the ICC is competing to have ICC tournaments and test mm -hmm. cricket. Each, there really is there's probably too much cricket for players to be able to play all formats. And I think in time, we'll see a right sizing of the products um, between having test cricket, 50 over cricket, T20 cricket, plus the T20 tournaments. 
we're definitely in a process of finding a right sizing, finding what is the appropriate amounts of cricket to be played. I think countries are going to start learning how to appropriately um, contract their players. Um, at the moment, a lot of countries, a lot of uh, provinces just contract players across the board, but there isn't really a distinction between the white ball cricket and red ball cricket. It's something we're still figuring out. So mm. IPL is a great product for players to learn, but in the whole mix of all the cricket that's available, one of the drawbacks is that players do go there and they get potentially get injured. That it does contribute mm. to the burnout, but I don't think it's the IPL's fault that <clears> there's burnout. It's just the amount of cricket and each province or national team, the way they're managing their players with the amount of cricket that's available. Mm. And a good or bad thing for, um, you know, respective countries, domestic leagues. I mean, do you think South Africa, for example, has enough depth in its uh, domestic structures, you know, especially after you, you know, lose players, we're going to lose players like Duplessis and Domini and Delstein, etc. You see, the domestic structure, the domestic four-day structure is, it's not attracting people to watch it. It's not, it's basically a, you know, a lot of money is spent on it to produce a few test players. So um, I think we'll see that the domestic product more going forwards. I think we're going to see T20 cricket is going to be the primary and dominant uh, domestic structure mm. because a 21 year old player can can do really well there where in test cricket you don't often see a 21 year old player. But straight it, into a Premier League or? Premier League really is, is, is the early access, mm. you know, it really is the opportunity South to South Africa's going to have its own Premier League at the end of the year. South Africa yeah. will have it. And I, th I think we'll see fairly soon that that in, in terms of we, if we contrast in two years time, the domestic four day mm. structure, what does that look like and how many people is that attracting and sponsors and television? And we look at the uh, CSA's, the, the T20 Global League. I think we'll very soon see there where the game of cricket is going and, and needs to go and we need to um, just manage that more smartly than potentially what we are at the moment.